Well, it's always fun being with wonderful teachers and educators like you and to hear all the people have spent the last couple of years writing a book and watching my friends Michael Ann and Terry from North Bay, then all the teachers that came on the Highway 400, hands up. <laughs> brave, you two over there were the last to get here. You're brave to keep coming. Because you fought all that way, you can pick a book from the back at the lunch, and I'll pay for it. Aww. Now, if they pick one of mine, that's even better, but <laughs> you don't have to. You can pick Michael Lange, you can pick Bob, or anybody. Anybody that does that and keeps going, that's like the supply teacher that never gives up. We love them. My job is to talk about looking back to see ahead. And I, I was looking through the book Back to Learning by Les Parsons, and um, it had some nice constructs for me to think about. As uh, your hair gets grayer, <laughs> or less, you begin thinking about, indeed, what did we do, and what should we keep doing, and what shouldn't we do? When I began teaching, of course, uh, before many of you were born, uh, on the cover of this book, Whatever Happened to Language Arts, the, the illustrator do an ink pot with a quill, and then a fountain pen, then a typewriter, then a keyboard, and now the phone. So you think of all the variety of media-making tools we've had in the last sort of 50 years, and I experienced them all except the quill. However, my grade five class had to use a straight pen and an inkwell. Does anybody remember that? Nobody, yeah? Yes. You're off from rural schools. <laughs> and uh, you who didn't have to use an inkwell and dip your pen in and then get a little blotter. And blotters were expensive. We had to rip them in half and only give a kid half a blotter at a time. You don't want to waste a whole blotter. And of course, ink's always fun to refill. I would pick, of course, the biggest kid in the class to do all the refilling always was Walter. We failed Walter every year because he could do all this stuff. In those days, we thought if we retained a kid long enough, he'd get bright. Some of us are still believing in that tragic thought. So I look at what, what has happened in the last 50 years, and as we hear the authors talk today, lots of bells ring about our own childhoods at home and at school. Lots of bells ring about what we did as teachers beginning and what our beginning teachers today who are here, what they see other teachers in the school doing. And what I want to think about is which of those should we retain and which of those should we change and which of those should we give up. But my real truth, and the one I want on my headstone, which will be happening soon, is all of the above some of the time. I don't want to throw anything out. I was thinking of the pen and the dip in the ink when Laura took summer school. She took a calligraphy class, and she came and said, David, you don't believe it. A lot of letters look the same. She had limited reading uh, difficulties, and when she took calligraphy, suddenly she saw how letters were shaped for the first time. Then I remember reading an article that said, for a child in grade one, when he types the O in the computer, it's an O. When he draws it, it's something round. So everything has its place. Everything has a way of being in the construct of that child's world. So I thought I'd start where Michael Allen and Terry did, which was poetry, because poetry, of course, is the least used adult form of text. Poets tell us if they can sell 200 books, they're really, really doing well. And of course, we have state-sponsored grants to help them because we still believe in the art form. For childhood, though, poetry is a very special thing. It's rather like finger painting and moving and singing in a choir. We don't do it much in life, but childhood's very special. We have certain things we do. We seldom play with plasticine again, unless you're Barbara Reed. Most of us, but in childhood, plasticine's that magic, magic tool. So I want to take a look at 50 years of poetry from my class. So 50 years ago, David wrote this. He was 12 years old. It's called Alone. On a windowsill three feet by one, five stories up, the window is locked. People stare, laugh, but none try to help. Different, very different. Not like people at all. I know their habits. I watch always. 
their stares never cease. So he does this image of being on this high rise on the ledge with the window shut, hanging over that world. That's how he felt at 12. But in my class of that time, I had them read their poems out loud. And then occasionally, I would read them out loud, give a little more power to the voice, a little more strength to the punctuation, as you talked about. So I read his, and I made a mistake. And I said, I know their habits. I watch always. Their stars never cease. When I was finished, I said, David, I love that metaphor of their star in the sky, rather like a Shakespearean thing. And he stood and walked out of my class. I said, I'll be back in a minute, everyone. <laughs> David, is there a problem? It wasn't stars, it was stares. The people are staring at me sitting on the ledge. I said, but you wrote stars. You didn't help me write stares. So I put that in every book since to remind myself that I have a responsibility of always protecting their work so it's the best they've got. Today, David is 61. <clears throat> 1970s, wasn't that a fun decade? Who lived through it, anybody? <laughs> Three of us. <laughs> it was a great decade. You could do anything you wanted. There were no limitations, no curriculum, no exams. <laughs> yeah, there was nothing. It was just fun. As a result, you are the product. So this is from the 1970s, and this is um, a boy named Alex. He's 14, just out of grade 8. And, and it's just a miracle today because it's called Bananas in a Throwaway Container. And that's just what we had as our example. So I am a tough guy hood. Me and the tough guy hood gang went down to our local grocery bar. There we bought a six-pack of bananas. Then on to our hood-like hangout the place where only roughs go, our local bowling alley. We broke out the bananas. Little John tossed an empty on the ground, and me, being your average coordinated hood, stepped on that throw away and landed with a resounding bang on the hard floor. I was in the hospital for four months. Because of my incident, there is on every banana a tag which says, caution, banana eating can be dangerous to your health. <laughs> and you think of the wit in that. His mockery of the tough guys getting a six-pack of bananas. This kid is 14 looking at the world and deciding who he is in this world. That was the result of a contest that the Council of English Teachers ran, and they asked me if I would judge the contest. Well, I was a young guy in Hamilton, a consultant with Bob Barton. So, sure, I'd be glad to get my name on a page. <laughs> and so 12,000 entries came in. So I had every human in Hamilton reading the kids' poems, the caretaker, the cleaning people, everyone, trying to find me the ones we could announce as the winner. And my favorite one really was a grade four girl that wrote, born free, as free as the grass grows, as free. <laughs> a lovely Pat Boone song. But <laughs> not all of us had teachers helping us. But that was my favorite, the Bananas one. And of those thousands of entries, many, many kids said, we're sending in these poems because our teachers haven't got time to read any. So we took the time, the caretakers, the cleaning people, and me, to read them. 1980s. This is um, Gordon Wells and Jan Wells' son, William, at the time. He was eight years old. The Wizard. Oh, grizzle wump with your icy smile. Slither and squirm away from here. I have no use for your wizardry. And I thought with all the Harry Potter today, this is a, a pre prequel to that entire world. And William had the way with words that his parents gave him, not his school, his parents. And he had that way with language always, and today still does. And he's 35. 1990s, we're getting close. This is called Escape. My cousin Norm and I walk along the sandy lake and watch as herons fly round and round endlessly to nowhere. They smell the lake as the soft wind blows through their wings. Then they quietly land and fight for fish. It's over. We turn around and head for civilization. 
soon we're on the highway, far from the great herons. So that was my son when he was 12. He's 32. His daughter's writing a poem next. She's five. And then how about this year? Emma, she's nine. Emma writes a poem so strange that I realize that the children's minds are rather like a huge banquet. Sometimes you're only at the appetizer. Sometimes you're at the full, complete cheese tray. And Emma, being, five, being nine, writes this very complicated story of a lifespan. Seeing the lights, first breath, coming home, going to school, first friend, grade three, Locker number, off to college, my own home, big white wedding, 55, going on 60, getting older, 65, family here, my eyes are closed, no one's crying, my time to go, it's the way of life, I'm still here, in your thoughts, my voice. And she's nine. Whatever happened to fun? So then we tap into their emotions sometimes, and what we get is such power. So there's 50 years of children writing in my lifetime. I can't wait for the next one, which will be my granddaughter, I hope. And your classes, you will have your kids writing amazing things. But it has to come from somewhere. I think when I began teaching, I did things like, all right, write me a poem. Hurry it up. Make it a haiku. <laughs> Canada's national poetic form. <laughs> and make, it emo make, it, make me weep when I read it. I'll be at my desk marking. I think that's how I taught. And then what happened is my grade 8 class that I loved and was king of that class, trust me, went to grade 9. And I thought they're destroyed. There's no hope. Those grade nine teachers don't know what teaching is. I do. You know, the kids come back the first couple of weeks to tell you what's happening in high school. And then they didn't come back till November, in the middle of November. I thought, well, maybe they've been forbidden. <laughs> I know they haven't forgotten me. And then they came back about the 20th of November each of them clutching a piece of parchment paper. And on that paper was a poem they'd written about Remembrance Day. And their high school English teacher, Dorothy Foster, had taken each of their poems and calligraphied them onto the most beautiful parchment paper with a gorgeous little motif and returned them to each child in tribute. And they all came back to show me how wonderful their English teacher, Miss Foster, was. <laughs> so you know what? We don't own anybody. They are just visiting us for a year or two. So what, what I love about the construct of, of poems is that they are so out of the box. They can be funny like the, the banana one. They can be reflective like Jay's with his uncle and his cousin. They can be dynamically strange, like the life cycle. Maybe her grandma died. They can be the, the inner, inner feelings of a boy at 12 who doesn't feel accepted. All these things can be reflected in their writing. So it isn't just the capitalization and the punctuation. You've got to start with the stuff like you said, doodling on the back of an envelope. I noticed that Thomas Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, which he wrote by hand on a beautiful calligraphy, they now have an exhibit of his first drafts, all crossed out with inky blots and X's and little words written up here. I was moved to tears on 60 Minutes last night when they showed it, because it showed how everybody risks and tries and attempts and I want children to know that that risking in the year 2012 is valued and wanted and needed. I've always talked about teachers' plan books. 
We used to have to have them done in case you had appendicitis. <laughs> and they were, they were looked at by the principal and marked for neatness. <laughs> and in thinking back, <laughs> the very last thing you want in the plant book is neat. Because you're trying things, you're guessing at things. You're t they should be full of yellow stickies like my plant book is right here. They should be full of cross-outs and ads and things that you just found out and things you remember in the YouTubes that Terry and Michael Ann showed. You, you want to have it all full of things. So plan books should be the messiest thing on earth. And if they're any good, they should be written partly in lipstick because you should be remembering that on your way to school, some neat thing you're going to do. <laughs> and instead of doing your lips, write that neat idea in your plan book with your lipstick. Because I, I, want, I want planning to be creative and always on the edge. I'm going to try this. I'll take that group there and we'll work with it. And then I, I want to talk about in the past we did the whole class novel and uh, that we do the same novels today which is interesting that the 60 years seems to have gone by too quickly. Uh, in grade 9 I can ask any kid in North America what is he will say to kill a mockingbird. Thank you. Sit down. And I was with Laura, and she was doing To Kill a Mockingbird in grade nine. <clears throat> and I walked in, and she was crying on the couch. I said, Laura, what is the problem? Let's cheer up. <laughs> I want dinner. <laughs> and she said, well, we have to read this novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, and I hate it. I said, well, how could you hate a novel? You can hate lots of stuff, but a novel, how do you hate a novel? It's terrible. And we've got 80 questions. So I said, can I see those questions? Yeah, they're in a little booklet here. I said, Laura, watch. Rip, rip. <laughs> well, she cried louder. She said, now I'm failing. <clears throat> yeah, but you're failing with integrity, and I like that better. And I said, what is this novel? And she said, I don't know. <laughs> when did it happen? Well, I don't know. I think it's sort of like long ago. Well, what was it in my childhood time? Well, when were you born? In the 40s, sort of. Is that, <laughs> is that when it was? And she said, well, I don't know. I said, well, let's look on the front of the book and see when it was written. And look, this is about the fifth edition. Try to go back and try to. And then we talked about Rosa Parks. So this novel couldn't happen today because we have a new fight. We have a new struggle we fought for in our country and in America, and that we harbored the slaves right here in our province. What do you mean? And we had this wonderful talk, and I went home, and I actually drove home. It wasn't far away, and I got her the Rosa Parks little book, picture book, brought it back, and we began reading about the stories of black people in our country and in America and what it meant and what this novel really was about. This novel wasn't about him, Atticus, it was about the man accused. And why we're doing that book, I don't know. I guess because there's kids in it. But it's a very, very tiny portrayal of a whole issue. And we need to look at the whole issue if we're going to do a novel, not just the 80 questions. And the only time you ever ask a factual question is if you need to know the answer for the big one. You never bother with a factual, none of you could remember it. I can ask anybody in the room what color his suit was, nobody will know. And that should remember who he was. And who was he? He was Gregory Peck. Because we remember the film, not the book. So we need to be very careful on what we took from the past and retain today. If we're going to read those books today, I have a friend whose daughter just read in 10th grade in a small town near North Bay, the book Sounder. The entire class read the book Sounder a good grade five book about the same issue, the condition of black families in America, sharecroppers. Do we have sharecroppers in Canada? That's where I would start. What were the seigneuries in Quebec about? Who owned that land? We can begin. But we can't begin by demanding we remember detail that's insignificant and never to be used again. That's a waste of our life. I will not waste a child's life and destroy a book in front of him. It seems to me a wrong thing. But there are times to read a whole class novel. When the grade seven class in Owen Sound, Corey's class, read The Breadwinner 
And then the boy said out loud, I don't think women in Afghanistan are treated this way. This is fiction. And the girl said, it's not fiction. You're fiction. And the teacher said, let's find out. And they began a three-week discovery of women in Afghanistan, the role of girls and women. They did online articles. They read articles so hard, but kids can leave out the hard words. They're smart. I do when I read a hard article. I only read what I want to read. They downloaded YouTubes. They actually phoned two soldiers who'd been in Afghanistan in Canada. They phoned and had radio or, um, phone interviews they recorded with them. They had such a knowledge. When I left, I knew more about the women in Afghanistan than I had any idea I ever would find out from those grade seven kids. So there are times we share as a class an entire theme that we're going to explore in great depth. We're going to know lots about it. It's going to be powerful for us. I love working in groups with kids because you get to hear their voices as you talked about in your work. I want to hear their talk voices. We did a project in North Bay where we teamed with a, a class in Brantford. We picked two big urban centers. <laughs> and we picked five novels and the kids could choose which two they wanted to read. They were good, no good hard novels. And then we had a video conference between North Bay and Brantford. And the kids debated, argued, talked back and forth from our literature circles because they'd read the same books. And here's the part I got to tell you. The one school was low economic area, often had yellow tape around it. The other school, your suburban well-to-do area. And in the discussion, which I've transcribed, you can't tell which is which. Those children's ideas are equity in person. And that they taught me so much, because I was working with the one group, I won't tell you where, and we're seated in the little circle, five of us, me and the kids, and the first paragraph said, the phone rang in the kitchen, and I said to the kids, gee, is that where you keep your phone? Thinking, well, I've got three phones, I've got a phone there, 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 and this girl said, we well, ain't got no phone. We don't keep it anywhere. And I never thought there might be a kid without a phone. I have a phone in my pocket. And she ain't got no phone. So right away by being part of that group, look what I learned. I'm not going to tell her she should have a phone. I'm going to listen and say, you know what? The kid in this story did. And if you had a phone, what color would you pick? And she said, of course, pink. <laughs> but the boy was more interesting. He was over here. And then about the third chapter in, it says they were listening to uh, their iPads, iPods, iPod, yeah. And I said, how many songs you got in your, oh, I'll do it in here. How many have over 1,000 songs on their iPod? 5,000 right there, here. How many have over 2,000? One. How many have no clue what an iPod is? <laughs> <laughs> how many still play the round records? <laughs> They're making a comeback, those round records. <laughs> how many have an eight track? All you guys from Highway 400 probably have an eight track. Anyway, so I say to this, this class, of course, my thinking, I'll try to be very current. I've got an iPod, but I'll try to be current. So how many have your songs? And this kid says, this was, I don't have an iPod, but guess what we do every single noon hour? I go home and have lunch with my mom, and the two of us hear country western while we eat, and you won't believe it. Those country western songs tell stories. You won't believe the stories you can tell in a country western song. <laughs> my mom and I, every single noon after we hear it, we talk about what on earth they did with that story, how that story happened as we have lunch. How many remember going home for lunch? <laughs> Those days are all gone. Wasn't it wonderful? Some things in the past I want to recover. I was in a school in Brooklyn where at lunch, they had lunch ladies patrol the, the tables and no one was allowed to talk. Today at lunch, I'll be patrolling the tables here. <laughs> I don't want a world where you can't talk over your hot dog. I don't want a world where we say you should talk in school, but not at lunch. Those lunch ladies are paid little bits of money to do hard work, and I guess they can't cope with noise. Time to retire. <laughs> I want people that can cope with the talk of children, because that's what childhood's about. 
they've been sitting quietly for three hours. Time to talk. So everything on your list, you two from North Bay, I can celebrate so easily with what we need to have today. And I want to look back and think, it wasn't wrong what we did. It was where we were. Forgive your parents. Forgive your grandparents. It's where they were. We're not there now, but don't you love the pictures of them when you put them in your album or on your machine or on your phone? Of course you do. What was the past, we celebrate the best of. We work with what it was, the dedication, the commitment of those people. And then we say, it's the new world. How will we use it in our new world today? How will we plug it in? How will we have wireless? How will we have heart? How will we have poems that say, express your innermost thoughts, I'll read it, and I'll comment, and if I make a mistake, I'll ask for forgiveness. What about all that for our children today? What was, was. What is, is. And what could be is why we're here. Nice being here.